semester. My name is Dylan Domini. I'm president of the Federal Society, and today I have the honor of having these two distinguished speakers with us today. I can, I can sit here and spend about 45 minutes probably talking about each of their accomplishments, but y'all get to listen to them, not me, so I'll try to keep it brief and hit the high points. So first we have Professor Blackman. Dr. Blackman, he's a national thought leader on constitutional law and the U.S. Supreme Court. He's testified before Congress and invited his lawmakers at both the state and federal level. He regularly, regularly appears on news outlets including NBC, CBS, ABC, Fox, and the BBC. He's published commentaries in the New York Times, Wall Street Journal, Washington Post, and other leading national publications. He kind of a big deal. Kind of is. <laughs> he has taught here in South Texas since 2012 where he's a Centennial Chair of Constitutional Law as well as being an adjunct scholar at the Cato Institute. He's authored three books and more than five dozen law review articles that have been cited nearly a thousand times. He was selected by Forbes, Forbes Magazine for the 30 Under 30 in Law and Policy. He's the president of the Harlan Institute and the founder of Fantasy SCOTUS, the, world, the internet's premier Supreme Court Fantasy League, and I'm assuming the only one. Undefeated. <laughs> Undefeated. <laughs> he blogs at the Volley Conspiracy and he tweets <laughs> at Josh Ann Blackman. You can find him pretty much anywhere else. Too. It's hard not to. <laughs> it's hard not to. You can't really ignore me. It's actually very harder to do that. And next we have <laughs> Judge Elrod. Judge Elrod, in order of importance, is a South Texas no, nurse. She's a mom. Oh. And, oh, and, oh. And, and, and no, I'm true. I'm a mom. No, you I'm always wait. I'm a mom of two grown daughters. Go ahead. In Thank order of importance, she is a mother, the yeah, South Texas true. jurist in residence, yeah. and a judge for the Fifth Circuit Court of Appeals, appointed by President George W. Bush in 2007. Prior to serving on the Fifth Circuit, she was a judge at the 190th District Court here in Harris County, where she spent five years presiding over more than 200 jury and bench trials. Prior to becoming a judge, she was working in private practice with focus on civil litigation and antitrust matters, as well as clerking for the Honorable Assembly for the Southern District of Texas. She's been repeatedly recognized for her work both as a jurist and for her pro bono work. An active member of the legal community, she has taught at Texas Tech Law, Brigham Young University Law, and the University of Houston Law Center, as well as serving on the Board of Regents for Baylor, the Board of Advisors for the Harvard Journal of Law and Public Policy, the Board of Visitors at BYU, and the American Law Institute. She regularly gives lectures on topics such as trial and appellate procedure, ethics, employment law, and constitutional law. She was appointed by Chief Justice John Roberts to serve as the chair of the Code of Conduct Committee for the Judicial Conference of the United States. But what are these two actually here to talk about today? I don't know. <laughs> well, you should know. I hope you do. Yesterday, the Supreme Court oh, of the United man. States heard arguments in the cases of Loper Bright Enter Enterprises versus Raimondo and Relentless Incorporated versus the Department of Commerce. These cases call the doctrine of Chevron deference into question. For those of you who don't know, and if I may oversimplify it a little bit, the doctrine of Chevron deference originates from the 1984 case Chevron USA versus National Resources Defense Council. In that case, the Supreme Court set forth the idea that when, a, when reviewing an agency's construction of a statute, which it administers in the absence of direct guidance from Congress, courts should defer to the agency so long as their construction is reasonable. Now, the doctrine is not exactly without controversy. To quote Loper Bright from its brief, quote, Chevron remains a judicially orchestrated shift of power from Congress to the executive branch and forces judges to prefer the government over the citizenry, which offends basic fairness. If you're interested, that's uh, page 10 of the petitioner's brief. Now these arguments beg a broader question on the separation of powers under our Constitution, a question that I'd like to turn over to our panelists today. Okay. Thank you so much to Dylan and the FedSoc chapter. Um, we're very lucky uh, to have Judge Elrod in the building as a jurist in residence. How many of you took our class for CIFPRO? We're taking it now. Oh boy, you got a home field advantage. So you're very lucky. I've had the honor of knowing Judge Elrod for more than a decade and she's been just a leading light. We don't have a real fire. She brings the fire. Uh, a leading light in the Houston community and also in the nation, so we're happy to be here. Um, before we get started talking about fishermen and deference, maybe we can do a little bit of a background sketch. And, and, and I actually was very deliberate by saying, important that she's a mom. Judge Elrod became a judge at a very young age while raising two amazing 
daughters. I have two daughters too, so I'm, I'm partial. Um, and maybe for the girls in the room, you know, how, how do you do that? How do you become a successful lawyer, right? Partner at a firm, elected to hold judicial office, presidential appointment to the circuit court at an age that, you know, was pretty young. How did you do it? Well, the answer for any person, male or female or anybody, is you do it um, with a lot of help. You do it, you have a good partner. You have, uh, and I have a great partner of 35 years. I would not be able to do this job, but for the fact that my husband stepped up. My mom came to, um, my mom came to work for us when my daughters were little. I became a judge when my daughters were four and two years old and I was campaigning in the, one of the largest counties in America at the same time with my four-year-old and two-year-old in tow. Um, so it's, um, it's been, a, they're grown now and we're easy nesters and so, and I have a daughter in law school myself, so. Uh, but, the, uh, but the most important thing is choose well in choosing a partner to do life with. Uh, is I think the best advice I can give you about anything today. Um, and don't be afraid to ask for help because this is not something you do on your own. Very true. Uh, Judge, maybe tell us a little bit particular, how does one become a judge? And, and I wanna tie this to the theme of today. Tell us about your love of the Constitution. And the separation of powers. I love the Constitution. We do. We I love it. We. It I have it. Me all the time. Always keep. I, um, anyway. And how how did that sort of fever for the law? Fever. I've got the fever. You got the, the fever for the law. I. Um, you know I don't. Um, I've. I mean I've loved the law since I was in the fourth grade, and I you know I went to see jury trials with my grandmother, mm. and that made me want to go even before that. Whenever and made me want to become. A lawyer. Um, my dad. My dad took me to see Justice Scalia speak uh, at Lamar University in Beaumont, Texas. Said, "Hey, I think you might want to go see this." Uh, and Justice Scalia spoke about things that I thought, but I didn't have the terminology, and I never really heard how. How does that work? And but it made such sense to me about. How, how to you know, interpret the Constitution, how to look at laws, and, um, and it just, I had, I had a lot of these kind of things broaden my interest. But to answer your question about how do you get to be a, a, a federal judge, um, one day I was speaking at an event in Austin and someone came up to me and said, hey, have you ever thought about being on the Fifth Circuit? Mm. And I said, yeah, and I've thought about being on American Idol, too. That's what I said to them. Probably not the best thing Did, to say. Do you know what American Idol is? That's a show. It used to be popular. Yeah. I don't Just know if it is anymore. <laughs> I Probably not. I think it's been rebooted or something, but nonetheless. Um, anyway, so, but that began a, a journey where then someone called me and said, I'm, you know, they're from the White House. They want to know if I was going to be considered. I began the journey to be and who called you, just of curiosity? What was his name? Which, which? Oh, I thought, I thought BK called you. No. No, he didn't Okay, call okay, me. never mind. No, he didn't so, call me. That's a different story. Okay. Um, I was interviewed um, by uh, Bill Kelly, okay. and this was during the Harriet Myers oh. era. Do you know who Harriet Myers is? That name ring a bell. And she was there. That's good that you don't know. So, <laughs> she, she's, a, she's a lovely Texas lawyer who uh, serves very well for access to justice issues, right? serves as the chair yeah. of that. So, go ahead. That's right. Okay, so next let's maybe pivot to a question that I know a lot of you think about, which is, okay, you're in law school now, maybe, mm -hmm. how many of you are one L's? Two L's. Three L's. All right, yeah, so yeah. good, okay, prime age. Um, clerking, right? When I went to law school, I didn't know what a clerkship was. I had no idea. Um, I thought it sounded interesting, and eventually I was able to- But you did clerk. I did, it's against all odds that I even got the clerkship. But maybe you can do better than me. What would a, maybe a 1L or a 2L need to know about clerking? And then if that's something they want to do, maybe what are the things they should sure. think about while they're in law school? As a 1L, you might want to do an internship in one of the courthouses and get the lay of the land. Uh, you need to make the best grades you can possibly make. 
and you, you need to draft a writing sample that you think is a good writing sample that you can go with. As a 2L, you need to apply. You don't need to wait uh, until the summer of your 2L year, whenever that opens up. I don't remember when the, this, this the middle of the year. Yeah. You, you should apply probably at the end of your 1L year, and then you should apply in your 2L year. And you should not wait for the plan, because too many judges don't do the plan, and you'll, and you'll miss out on opportunities. Um, you should, so you should send your perfect, with uh, no typos, writing sample, perfectly blue book writing sample, and perfect cover letter, and a um, one page resume that two or three people have proofread for you. Because if you have an error, you'll be put in the, in the file that you're not. You'll be put in the fire, that's where you're gonna be put. In the, well, I, that's a little dramatic. But, uh, <laughs> <laughs> but because. Don't get burned. Because the, uh, ha, ha, the idea <laughs> is that we want you to help us make our work perfect. So if your work is that you're submitting to us on the first go round, when we get a lot of applications and your work is not perfect, it's gonna be a problem for you. Um, you do need to make the best grades you can make. It's, um, it's, and you should apply uh, to a lot of different kinds of judges. There are state clerkships, there are federal clerkships, there are bankruptcy, there are magistrate judges. There are, in addition to district and circuit judges, there are Supreme Court justices from different states as well. You should apply at all these different levels. You should probably talk to, to Professor Blackman or someone to figure out where where might be a good place for your first clerkship? Because you may have more than one. But anyway, you should do that all in your 2L year, if, or at the end of your 1L years, but you should have gotten all the stuff done for your 1L year. In your 3L year, if it didn't go well in your 2L year, you should apply again. Yeah, sure. and, and so you got, and there's other judges that won't consider you without two full years of grades. And so at least a year and a half of grades. And so you'll have different judges look at you that didn't look at you before. And there'll be new judges that have come on board. So you, this is something that you like go after and you continue to pursue. And you should pursue this maybe um, for a couple years after you've True. gone to practice if this is something that you really wanna do. People go back and do it later. So it doesn't, you don't just have one shot and you're done and oh, I didn't get it or whatever. This is, you apply early and often and with your best foot forward. Very good, thank you, thank you for that judge. Um, I'll just highlight a few points. Grades are extremely important. Um, I could show you the list of the people who have gotten clerkships from this law school the last decade or so and they were all at the tip top of their class. Um, I'm very excited. I have Eric Williams coming to clerk for yes, me next year. Yes, ma'am. Valedictorian. He's terrific. He's, yeah, he's number one in his class. I've had uh, Kenesha Starling, who did very well in her class, come and be my intern, and she did a clerkship down the hall. Yes. Um, so people who I know who get clerkships have done very well here. You, so you need to do well. Cl clerkships in my building. You have to. So number one, grades tip top of the class. Number two, references. Um, you need a professor who can vouch for you and can tell the judge this will be a good match for you. Uh, you can't discount the fact that a judge might know professors and they don't know you. And that's an important step to getting there. Even if yeah. you get the interview, I get phone calls from Judge Elroy and other judges saying, what do you think of so-and-so? And I can give their honest opinion. And I'm honest, sometimes I say, not, not the best fit. And I, I said that before, because that makes my recommendation credible. You need someone who has a good rapport. You don't rapport. want someone who just cheerlead the professor it's for, not fair. for any student. They would need to be helpful to say what would be a good fit, absolutely. And the third factor is tenacity. Unfortunately, there's not like a easy way of applying. There's a, there's a website called Oscar, but you have to make phone calls, because the information Oscar is not always accurate. You know, is a judge still hiring? Sometimes they'll say on the website, yes, we're hiring, but then you call, it's like, no, we filled that position a month ago. Just, oh, we forgot to update the website. Trust me, it happens. Yeah, so, don't just rely on Oscar. If you just rely on Oscar, I think you're, you're, you're done. missing maybe half of your opportunities. And, and you need to do hard copy applications yes. for a lot of places. It's really hard to just disregard some piece of paper that's on your desk. Yeah. Um, you gotta find a place to put it. And I put mine with Olivia, and she has some applications on her desk right now. That, this is Olivia Horton, one of my law clerks. There's JP, one of my other law clerks. 
No, well, one of my other law clerks, oh, you, Ben. You, you outed them, they're gonna get harassed after the, the event. <laughs> so, yes, so that's where, so, but it's having a paper application, unless the judge specifically says on Oscar that nope. no paper, absolutely no paper, you should add to the, you, the, you know, the, I know it's bad for the trees, but it's really not. They plant more trees exactly. every year. Did y'all you know that? The tree yes. companies plant way more trees than, the, than they use all the uh, but I don't want to get into an argument about that, so that's just an aside. See, that's why we're reporting. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, <laughs> all right, okay, so those are the three things to think about. Now let's actually pivot to the topic du jour and why you're all here, um, the separation of powers. Now, who's taking, who has not taken con law yet? Ooh, boy, all right. A lot of people haven't taken con law, yeah. So very often when you think about the Constitution, people think of the rights, you know, you have a right of free speech, you know, you have the right to religion, you have the yeah. right to bear arms, and Josh, the, what's the most important part of the Constitution? The structure. Amen. The structure <laughs> and the separation of powers. Justice Scalia, who the judge mentioned, would often say that you have these pieces of paper with massive called parchment barriers that don't mean a thing. And unless there's structure in the government, rights are insecure. Yeah, many, many countries around the world have voluminous rights in their constitutions. You know, um, Russia has more rights listed in its bill of in, in its constitution than what we have listed in ours. Um, did you did you know this that many countries have lots and lots of rights in their constitution, but it's what we call a parchment guarantee. It means it doesn't really mean anything. It's not worth the you know the paper it's written on because you can't enforce those rights. Those rights are not they're not recognized. And what makes our system work so well is the structure of the Constitution and part, and the biggest part of that is the separation of powers. Our founders were very smart in knowing that you needed to have branch competing against branch so that people, so that, so that it would be, you know, as people are asserting their, their, their sphere of influence, their power, that it would work the best and that it would have the maximum amount of liberty and the maximum amount of, of a workable government. And so that's why people talk about separation of powers. And also, I just wanted to say something really quickly. Uh, I'm very thankful to, to my student, Eric, who invited me from the FedSoc originally to come and speak, and I'm thankful to Dylan. And I'm thankful if you, if, um, if you don't know what the, what the FedSoc is, if this is your first time, I, VEDSOC is a group that invites a bunch of speakers with diverse viewpoints to come and talk about the Constitution or other legal issues. Um, it's, there, it's like, other, I encourage the VEDSOC to work with other groups on campus. Anybody who wants to talk about constitutional issues, it's, a, it's an open place. You, there's not a viewpoint that you need to have. It's not, a, it's not a political group. In fact, it's by its bylaws, it's not allowed to be a political group. It is a group for people who just want to discuss interesting constitutional issues in a debate-like forum. And so, that, so I'm grateful to them for having me. I used to be a, a, a member when I was a student um, many, many years ago. Thank you. That was a very good introduction. So Judge, there are really two kinds of separation of powers. We say there's horizontal separation of powers and the vertical separation of powers. What's the difference between horizontal and vertical separation of powers. Okay, the horizontal is when you're, you know, as between the branches, you know, the, the article one and then the article two and the article three, and the vertical is the up and down. Y'all get that, right? It's not, yeah. was just, Josh, was there something you wanted to get to for that? that you? And that so what role <laughs> does, this is my segue to Chevron, so what okay. role do the courts in particular play in the horizontal separation of powers? We adjudicate cases and controversies that come to us. Um, and some of those uh, involve decisions that are made by agencies uh, that affect people's rights. Mm -hmm. um, and in order to, to adjudicate those, we have to know um, whether or not we need to defer to the agency in, in, in the decision that, that they've made, 
or do we just judge the thing straight up de novo? What is the standard of review by which we 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 evaluate what the agency has done? Do you know that we have lots of agencies throughout the government? Do you, are you aware of this? Can can you think of some agencies? Throw out some kinds of agencies. Acronyms. Alphabet soup. <laughs> yes. There tons you go. and tons of agencies. <laughs> And these agencies make regulations. They do formal adjudications. They do informal adjudications. They do guidance. They do formal and informal guidance. They are always guiding us and telling us things about their sphere of influence. And so um, some, some say that it's beyond their spheres, and that's a different topic for a different day. So, so they're telling us what the standards are because over time, th there has become a, a, an interesting development. Mm -hmm. Congress has decided that instead of making laws that have a lot of specifics, that it will make really general laws and let the agencies fill in all the details. And this is not something that the, um, that the founders envisioned. They thought that Congress would want to maximize its power and legislate to the full extent of their power. But actually, Congress, uh, many Congress people don't even have legislative writers in, on their staff. They have PR people, they have uh, all kinds of other people, but they don't, and people who deal with the, uh, liaisons with the various agencies and mm -hmm. things, but they don't even all, Writing laws is not the number one job of Congress, which you might have thought it was uh, at the time of the founding. Congress has decided that, uh, for whatever reason, but some would say that it's because they, it's, it's better to let someone else fill in the details because then you can't criticize them if you don't like what you get. Mm -hmm. I don't know if that's why, I don't know if it's because of the, the gridlock we have in society and it's really hard to write legislation, I'm not in their shoes, they have a difficult job. But what has happened is we get laws that say clean water is good. And, and that's an exaggeration slightly. But uh, <laughs> if you say clean water is good and then you say you go fill in the details. And you can say, well, there's some good in that because the people who fill in the details are really trained, rigorous scientists and people with all mm -hmm. kinds of expertise. And they're the best people to tell us how to get clean water. And I'm not trying to pick on any particular agency here. I'm just Kill the using trees. this as, a, as an example. <laughs> you know, so maybe, maybe we should save the trees. I, I, I was not making any comment about Aprilist versus not or anything like that. So anyway, but so, so the idea being uh, the agencies are filling in the details. But sometimes there's a, a dispute about whether or not they're filling in details, like what is a reasonable standard or what the specific number of per parts per million of something to be, mm -hmm. uh, should be. It would be a very scientific question. Instead, sometimes people believe that the agencies are the ones that are making a law that's different than what Congress did or that Congress never intended to delegate that decision to the agencies. And so people clash with agencies. We have had a lot of really interesting agency cases uh, in my court, and certainly in the D.C. Circuit where many agency cases mm -hmm. are heard, but throughout the country, because the D.C. Circuit is not the only circuit hearing agency cases, as my law clerks can attest. And the Supreme Court this term, as you heard, as late as yesterday was grappling with the standard by which judges evaluate decisions made by agencies. All right, let's, let's give so the facts. So that's where we are, I got it. Yeah, Gabe, facts. you wanna do the facts in Loper Bright? Uh, sure. he, he was in my class last semester, so I'm putting okay, him on the spot. Okay, put him on the spot. Go ahead, Gabe. You, if you're, you get cold, cold everywhere with me, there's not, it's like, there's not a, you never escape it. Uh, basically, uh, I forget the alphabet soup. Magnus and Stevens Act, it was, yeah. The, the, the National Fish, Fisheries and Wildlife Service? No. Is this the nice fisheries. of you to do this to him? Oh, fine, okay, fine. Okay. So here are the facts of the case. I, here are the facts of the case. Congress enacts this complex regime about fishermen. 
and they say the government can require inspectors to board a boat and inspect the fishery. Now, this is not like you know a little boat you put up in the bay, you go out for an hour, you come back. These are boats that might go out to sea for weeks at a time. They're very cramped. They're very dangerous. You're often in very sh harsh waters, might be very cold. And having another person on the boat has an effect. You have one less fisherman. Less fish are going to be caught. Your revenues are cut. Okay. The statute says that in some places, for example, the Pacific, where there's very lucrative fishing waters, that the fishermen will pay the cost of the inspector. You might think that's a bad decision, but Congress made that call. Okay. But what about the Atlantic? where they have different types of fish that are not as lucrative. The statute says nothing at all expressly about whether the fishermen can be required to pay for the inspectors. So what did the executive branch do? They issued a rule. A rule is not a statute. It's not passed by Congress. It's not approved by the president. A rule is put out in something called the Federal Register. It's this big, well, it's not really a book anymore, but it was a big book that said, here are all the rules we have. We'll seek comments from the public. We don't care if you object, we'll just sort of reply to them saying, okay, that's nice, right? And then we'll put that to rule which has a force of law. But the question is this. Can the fishery service put this requirement in a rule that fishermen have to pay out of their own pockets for these inspectors? So this goes before court. And then the court needs to say, do they look at, they need to first decide how, what deference do they give to the a lot of questions in law, in fact, I was working on one in a totally different context today. It was all about the standard review. We were going round and round. I was going with Olivia and Noah about the standard of review in a case. It, oftentimes, the standard of review is the whole ball game in many cases. That's right. the, the, how much deference? Do we look at something straight up the middle, de novo? Do we look at it? For clear and convincing, you know, the, the error has to be clear and convincing that we're deferring to a factual finding of district court. So the issue is, what kind of deference do we give to the decision that the agency made to require this 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 particular um, fishing regulation? You know, do we say, well, it's not in the statute? I mean, this is just hypothetically, it's not in the statute, so um, it doesn't get any deference mm -hmm. at all. Mm -hmm would be one approach. One said, oh, well, the Congress meant to delegate to them this entire sphere. And so just because it didn't say specifically about Atlantic and it did about Pacific, it, it, it doesn't mean that they can't, and we need to defer. So Chevron is a, is a, a rule that says where things are ambiguous, or there's an ambiguity um, in the statute, that you get to give, that you do give a deference as long as it makes sense and that it's not clearly nonsensical and that sort of thing. So you, it's a two-step process uh, normally, um, although there's some, but that's, that's good enough for right now, it's a two-step. Uh, and so, so the question I would be asked is, is the statute ambiguous on this point? And I think that there's a, there should be a robust review of the question, uh, a fair, robust, review of the question on prong one, say, look at the statute to see if there is, uh, if it's there. Um, and then also a robust view of, of two for on whether or not it does make sense or whether it's absurd or not. So uh, you get a robust view in both prongs. But if you don't win on, if the agency doesn't win on Chevron one, that there's an ambiguity, then you go straight back to, to looking at it straight up the middle. So you don't, well, unless there's some other form of deference like Skidmore or Our or something, it's, that's another, this is an ad law class question that's very complicated. But anyway, there are these other intermediate lesser standards of deference and the court grappled with those like yesterday. But the big question is, should you defer? And what type of deference should you get? Um, and that's, it's really important in society. Um, some would say, and I think Mr. Clement said yesterday, um, that we sh you need to not defer to agencies because they're not actually using technical expertise, they're doing their own thing, and you should, and, and if the Congress didn't speak, that Congress wants the people to have the most freedom and liberty. Others would say, 
No, it's super important because these are very technical and difficult. Uh, Ms. Prelozier, who, who's Loger, who's very, very, a very good solicitor. She's I, really good. Obviously, Mr. Clement is also a very good lawyer, and there, and there were other, other lawyers too yesterday. <coughs> but um, you should listen to these she, arguments because the lawyers are so excellent. You can set, go, wow. Uh, and you, these are available. You can go on. You know, on SCOTUS and click it. Uh, and Clement it. came to our class this semester. Okay. Oh, really? Wow. Yeah, by Zoom, so, so we're very happy to he have him. He and I are law school classmates, so I've known him for many years. But, um, but they, so they would say that because it's so technical, it's really important that we don't get a lot of random courts making uh, intermediate decisions all over the country on particular issues. Uh, and that it's better to have a, a unified federal government approach and that it's followed throughout the government. And they would also say that this, this uh, randomness that they would say is in the court decisions um, also takes time and so there's uh, things evolve and take too long. So that's, that would be their side of the argument, I think. Did I? Yeah, very, okay. very good. So let me ask the question a little bit differently. What is the cost to individual liberty, right, when courts defer. Because think of it one way, if the courts defer to the agency, the agency is democratically accountable, right? There's a president, there's a secretary of whatever who can make decisions, there's a name. But when the courts don't defer, maybe they decide de novo, that is new, then wouldn't it be that the courts are making these decisions? And as much as I love Article Three judges, they're not accountable by design, right? They're insulated from accountability. They have life tenure. Their you salaries can write are guaranteed. Mean tweets about me, and they do, and they do. Oh and boy, they, they do, do all the time. But, but I have tenure, can, also same thing. But you cannot. But you absolutely. Um, you, you, the precedent is that you really can't impeach a judge because you don't like the decisions that that they make. Wait. Um, so, <laughs> not so, you. And, no, at this point, the precedent is that you can't. That that's not a grounds for impeachment. So you really are stuck with the judge, judge's decision, and you don't get to pick us. We're already picked, um, you know, and stay for many, many years. And so, but the but the agencies also, you don't know who the heads of. I bet you, if I asked you, it'd be only if you'd seen a case name in a while would you know, because no, maybe some of you might deal with heads of certain agencies, but you probably don't know those people either, mm -hmm. and they're not democratically accountable. Remember, the people who are democratically accountable are Congress, the ones that are supposed to be writing the laws, and then, of course, the executive. Um, so those are, so you've got two groups of people who are not democratically accountable. Mm -hmm. Who, which of them should have the say? Mm -hmm. That's the decision that you have in this, in this Chevron thing. Mm -hmm. And another element of Chevron that Justice Kavanaugh brought up yesterday was what happens every four to eight years, right? Um, it seems every four to eight years you have a new president come into office and they have a new administration. And they say, okay, we want to reverse the policy of our predecessor. So the way it works is administration number one gets Chevron deference. Next administration changes the rule, they get deference too. And the third one comes in, deference as well. To give you an easy, easy example, uh, something called net neutrality, which is the idea that the government should regulate broadband companies, that they can't uh, discriminate against types of internet traffic. This was an issue when I was in law school a million years ago. Like in 2006, 7, 8, this was an issue during the first Bush administration. And then the Obama administration flipped it the other way. It said, yes, we need regulations. And then the Trump administration said, no, no, we don't need those regulations. And now Biden's saying, yeah, yeah, we need them again. And who knows what happens in a year and a half, right? Um, how does, Judge Elrod, how does this idea of deference fit in with the idea that every four to eight years you have another administration sort of flipping around and it's not really based on expertise, as Judge Kavanaugh said. It's based on the priorities of the current administration. Well, I, I, I'm not going to open oh, up what the basis of it is. Oh, I asked the wrong question. You can't, you know, I'm not going to say whether it's based on expertise okay, or not. Okay, fine. But the problem is, is that you're, by the time, it takes a while for these cases to wind their way through the system. So the rule can change before you ever get to the end of the system with all of the cases going on. And so you have cases under the old rules, mm -hmm. 
and you already have a new rule in place, and sometimes the administration won't, doesn't even want to fool with them anymore, mm -hmm. and says, oh, well, we concede, we're going to move on, and, you know, and so it's a very, um, it's a fraught process. It's a fraught process with lots of, you know, going back and forth, and I think that's a good example of, a, of an obvious one where there are very different administration priorities. Mm -hmm. You also have, you know, within the agencies, there are people who are there for many, many years, institutional people mm. uh, that may have their own thoughts as well, and they may know how it works within an agency, um, and they may be, um, so it may not necessarily be mm. administrative priorities, of, it may be institutional priorities, mm -hmm. so that's a complicating factor. I think probably people would say that the judiciary has institutional priorities too, and that's a complicating factor in, in our branch. We have we have parallels between these unelected branches, um, but the problem is is that the Congress, I mean, the, the Constitution talks about courts, but it doesn't talk about agencies. Nope. And so this is a really interesting development in our law of how do you balance the set, you know, the separation of powers that we're all supposed to be vigorously uh, pushing our power in each branch, although our branch is the least dangerous branch, and we have been uh, throughout history, although some would say now we've become a little muscular. Um, we've been working out or something, but, um, <laughs> It, it, so this is a, you know, so how, do, what is this wrinkle, uh, this giant wrinkle of having administrative agencies within the system of the government, how does that impact the separation of powers? Uh, so Justice Kagan asked a different type of question, and she said, look, I get it. There's some cases where maybe the president is a, has a, an agenda enforcing his preferences, but other cases you actually have really hard questions, for example, Right, is a certain type of drug diagnostic or is it uh, a therapeutic, right? How many parts per million of a certain uh, pollutant can be allowed to be discharged in a stream? Right, these are questions that require, frankly, PhDs to even understand what the heck the issue is. Um, you know, Judge Elvard, your, your clerks are very smart. Maybe they have PhDs. I sure didn't. And I know members of your court perhaps don't have those PhDs. If you jettison, if you get rid of Chevron, how do you then decide these hyper-technical cases that, that, that judges may not have the sort of the, the, the knowledge base and expertise to even comprehend? Well, I don't think the questions are those questions. And I think um, Mr. Clement pointed that out yesterday. Um, and, and, you know, I think there, some questions might be those kind of questions. But most of the questions are, is does this mean now, or does this, does this provision mean this is reasonable? The, the questions are about language most of the time. What does the word in the statute mean? That's what you're quibbling over, which courts are very well equipped to use the tools, um, you know, in the Scalia Garner book, uh, Matter of Interpretation, you know, and, and, and go through and use these canons of construction, courts are you best really well equipped to use these tools. Uh, that, that's our bailiwick. And most, and many, many of these questions are language and word questions. What does this mean? Not what is the correct, you know, milliliter of this that's the science than this molecule or, some, you know, it's not a chemistry question or a biology question usually. Uh, that's being asked. That's the that's the lead question. So so, sure, you should defer to the science mm -hmm. when the science is being used. Mm -hmm. But if it's not about science and it's about statutory construction, that's in our wheelhouse. I I, I agree. Um, let's do some questions from students. You know, ask the judge what, what's on your minds. Uh, yeah, Gabe. And then yeah. Um, so off of that scientific approach, um, or deferring off of the scientific parameters, do you think it's more likely that you need a detailed opinion on the how and where because you're more concerned? With I don't know. I'm. You should ask Professor. That's a Black Josh question. Then. That's a Josh question. I. Well, I'll just say my very judgy answer is 
Whatever the Supreme Court tells me, I will do my very best to follow it as best I can. So, Josh, what do you think they're going to do? Uh, you know, <laughs> Justice Barrett had a phrase. She's, she's, she's clever. She said, should we Kaiserize Chevron? What the heck is that? So a couple of years ago, there was a case called a Kaiser versus Wilkie and involved another deference doctrine called Auer. That's spelled A-U-E-R, not like an hourglass, Auer. And the court said, okay, we're not going to get rid of our deference. We're just going to get rid of it. Um, in other words, the court sort of rewrote what the standard was without saying so. John Roberts loves doing that. He doesn't actually overrule things. He just overrules them quietly. So it's entirely possible that they sort of rewrite Chevron, make it sort of this Frankenstein monster that kind of looks like Chevron, but oh, monster, right? It's just, but, but it gives the courts far more discretion at the first step about finding ambiguity. And frankly, I, I was going to ask this question. I didn't. What does it mean for something to be ambiguous, Judge? Th this, this is a question that the SG did not handle. I don't, maybe you disagree. Maybe you, I don't answer. I don't think she did well on this question because there's not a good answer. But, but what is ambiguity? I mean, what, what does that term mean in the abstract without regard to any case or controversy that comes before you? See what I did there? I, that's, We've done know, this before. I, I don't think that um, it can possibly mean that if I could think of some kind of moon is made of green cheese kind of example, mm -hmm. that that makes something ambiguous. Mm -hmm. It has to be what a reasonable, that reasonable people mm -hmm. discussing the issue would generally, genuinely be perplexed and, and torn. Um, reasonable people be perplexed. Now that may not, that's not, that may not be good enough. It doesn't mean though that just because two people submit a brief with opposite points, that a law is ambiguous. In fact, we often, I think I can say this, we have case law that says that we're, even where both sides have said, this is ambiguous. Yeah. Both sides come in and tell us it's ambiguous and it means certain, one side says one thing and the other side says, no, it means this, but it's ambiguous. And uh, you have to use these, this happens in contracts law. So it doesn't have to be some fancy agency law. You know, that you have to use these, uh, what the custom in the industry is. Mm -hmm. Y'all had contracts, right? And they do the custom in the industry instead of the words on the page if it's ambiguous. Well, they'll come in and say, well, it's ambiguous, ambiguous. The custom in the industry is this. And they'll say, no, the custom in the industry is that. Well, the court can say, no, it's not ambiguous. We don't need to look at the custom in the industry because the word means this. Um, so courts have a power to say something is not ambiguous, even though people are arguing opposite meanings mm -hmm. to the term. And that happens throughout law. Mm -hmm. That's not just in this unique uh, agency context. Well, let, me, let me tweak the question. So you sit in panels of three judges usually. What if you know, one or two members of the panel say that this is not ambiguous, the other one says this is ambiguous? The fact that even three judges can't agree, it does that undermine ambiguity? It, no. Something is not ambiguous just because people disagree, whether they're judges or lawyers right or lay people. Yeah. Very good. That, that is a cop out, I think, to just say, just because we disagree today, it automatically makes it in the ambiguous side of the house. And, I, I don't believe yeah. that. That's and, and to be clear, with the, the cop out is what to go to Chevron step two, because once you say the statute's ambiguous, you basically roll over and you defer to the statute. Well, ambiguous. you may not yeah. roll over. Oh, that's a harsh. I'm sorry. You defer. It. You, you, you uh, defer. And you still have to look at whether it <laughs> makes sense. We have a number of opinions, Josh, <laughs> Professor. That, Josh is good. Um, <laughs> they call me Josh. It's fine. She's Josh. I'm Josh. We have a number of opinions that say that even if you get to step two, we would still do the same thing mm -hmm. because it is not, does not make sense and yeah. it's not the reasonable construction. Mm -hmm. So we sometimes go all the way through belt and suspenders on cases. Mm, I like it. Okay, question over here. Yes, Judge Elrod, you mentioned concerns that federal agencies aren't necessarily as accountable to the people as say Congress. And neither are judges. I want to make sure I'm not being unfair to my, my friends in that. But, in uh, Washington. There's, there's another concern recently with uh, sort of a revolving door with the private sector and federal agencies where regulators at federal agencies will take jobs with the companies that they used to regulate, which creates a concern of conflict of interest. Do you think that that sort of supports the idea that Congress should be more involved in drafting the specifics of legislation than how they see the court? I think if Congress would get more involved in drafting legislation, we could solve a lot of problems in America. Um, so um, 
so, so that's just one minor, but, but you know, one, one minor one. I mean, you could say that people come in and out of our law offices too or something. I, I just want to be as fair as possible. But it's not just that they go from industry, they also go to other groups that care about the issues. There's a lot of, um, that's the, when you have a specialized group that decides issues. That's, it, we get the, the danger, and we say it in courts, when you have courts that are not courts of general jurisdiction, mm -hmm. we call them captive courts. The idea that you can become captive to the industry. And that doesn't mean on the business side next, it could be on the public interest side of the house, it could be a captive to the industry. Uh, it, it's, it's, so, in general, I prefer general courts so that we have rules that apply all across the field of law and we try to apply them uniformly because we're, and we're not specially related to any particular industry, uh, either on the business side or on the public interest side. Um, so I think that's good. Now there are some technical benefits, obviously, to, to that on the agency that we wouldn't have. Very good. What other questions we have? Come on. Oh, come on. I told you, my students, if you asked a question, that something good would happen, or then I'll make sure I'd ask Come it. on, one else. You Let's can, hear I it. I told you you could ask me a hard question. Come you on. don't have to ask me about agencies. You can Whatever just you ask want. me some random question. Yeah, right there. Thank you. What was your favorite case that you tried to watch? It's like asking, do I like my older daughter or my younger daughter better? <laughs> I, I'm not going to do that, um, but I will say that you know some of my cases have been um, from from when I first started that they've been they've been cited and they've been they've you know carried on and so that's that's always exciting to see that something that you wrote has has meant something in in the law. Um, I, I think that, and this is not my favorite case, but I had a case um, with the en banc court in a, um, in a context of, of religious freedoms for students in schools, um, and I wrote this opinion, and I wrote a partial dissent and a partial majority for the en banc court in a qual com very complicated qualified immunity case. And it's cited in the religious liberties area, and it's also cited in the qualified immunity area um, today still. So that's that's kind of cool. Um, I you know I have a case right now where I may get reversed by the Supreme Court, but it's been, mm -hmm. but it's. Um, and that's not a reflection that, that she's wrong, by the way. It means yeah. the Supreme Court's no, wrong. No, well, I mean we don't know. But Trust it's me. Well, no. But it's ex <laughs> it's exciting to see really fine scholars, professors, and people writing on something that you've written and giving their opinion, you know, their impressions of it, and you say, this is the way I see how agencies work or how jury trials should work, and I've articulated that. And to see, well, I wanna, you know, you engage, you don't really engage unless they're in your case, but you see how it percolates beyond you and it's, it's, that's an exciting part of being a judge, is to watch the law and to study the law and to be a small part of something that's a, 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 a you know, joint enterprise that has meaning for, for our country. When the Supreme Court stays the Fifth Circuit, the Supreme Court's wrong. All right, <laughs> next question. Yeah, right over there. Um, you <laughs> Voice when the Supreme Court what? No, not the Supreme Court. She said there's various agencies and groups that often will step in to sue the federal agency. Well, I mean, they before they even have the suit, if the agency is doing formal notice and comment, the people can weigh in. People get frustrated because sometimes they do these informal guidances and things, and there's not an opportunity to speak up before those come out, and sometimes. Um, People in agencies want to give those force and power, um, and then you have to wait till there's a, a, so you don't know whether you can do the thing that you want to do because the agency's saying it has force of power until someone actually litigates it 
and you have to get it teed up so to be litigated, but it causes people to change their behavior or not, or be stymied and not know what they can do because they don't know if the informal guidance is really valid or not. So, so there's, but there is a chance to have the people have their say. Um, one way people have their say, and we get, a, there are a lot of um, amici bri briefs and things that are filed in these lawsuits where different people and different, you know, the, the Fisher people will, and the people in the other related industries will follow. And then people who are concerned about the, the fish will file a brief. You know, so people from all different points, they, they, they file it to mm -hmm. say, don't forget this. Uh, for some people, that's very important. For, it's some, for some of the decisions that the courts make, it's not as important, because sometimes it's just a, you have to decide what this word means, and it doesn't matter what the, you know, you know whether you're gonna say yay to me or boo, uh, I still have to decide what the word means. So. so we've talked a lot about suing agencies, but agencies can also come after you. And one such agency is the SEC, not the Southeastern Conference, maybe football fans, the <laughs> Securities and Exchange Commission. Mm -hmm. And very often when the SEC tries to take action against you, you may not get a jury trial right. Right? We learned the Seventh Amendment guarantees the right of jury trials, and the SEC like, says, nah, you don't get a jury. So there's an opinion, very heavy, good, it's a good weight, <laughs> by Judge Elrod called Jarkozy versus SEC, which is for the Supreme Court right now. And maybe you want to talk about Jarkozy a bit. Well, I, you know, the Supreme Court was going to decide what it's going to decide. There were uh, three decisions made in the Jarkozy case. Uh, I can just tell you the procedural history, you know, that that's, I'm not allowed to advocate or say what I think the court should do in any particular case. Um, but they, the, we held that you had a jury trial right and that you couldn't do, to, uh, adjudicate the fraud complaints in the agency with a, because what was happening in the SEC and uh, just like in many, in, in other agencies too, you, they had the, they would bring the claim, they would prosecute the claim, they would bring it in in a in court within the, in an adjudicative body within the agency, uh, and then the appeal would also be heard by people within the agency. So it's all contained within the branch. Um, and this opinion says that those rights are akin to, to, to rights that people had to a jury trial, you know, under the Seventh Amendment and, and even before the founding of the country, um, uh, under common law, that you have a jury trial right. And we held that those trials could not take place in the, um, in the, within the agency. And a lot of people have a lot of thoughts about that. We also said that the, the way that they replaced the people in the agency was uh, because they weren't, uh, was the president free to replace the people or not? That was also an issue. Uh, and then whether or not um, this had been delegated from, the, from Congress or not. So this had several points, but the, the point that the court was most interested at during oral argument, which doesn't necessarily mean what the court's gonna do, uh, was the jury trial mm -hmm. issue. People filed briefs and things saying that it was either cumbersome and, and difficult to have these done, or that there was a case from the Supreme Court that already said you don't have a jury trial right. Um, and then other people filed briefs and said, of course you should have a jury trial right. This is not fair to have the, the entirety of the prosecution be within the branch mm -hmm. with the same people. So, Excellent. So that's, that's a, I think that's a neutral summary of that case. Very good, and I thought it was a, <laughs> You know, if, for whatever reason, if you're in my Supreme Court seminar, the, the Supreme Court has taken interest in the Fifth Circuit in recent years. And there are, <laughs> there, there are a number of cert grants for my beloved Fifth Circuit. Um, and, uh, well, this term, there are a lot of them. And they're, mm, I, think, I think we're done. I think there's no more, nothing left for this term, I don't think. Uh, but, uh, you never know. I'm not going to. Uh, you know what? That shadow docket. Who, by the way, okay. But, Does what, anybody? Do you want to talk about the shadow docket or no? I wasn't going to ask about it, but it just, it just seeps into my head. Mm -hmm. Well, I appreciate uh, <laughs> Professor Vladek writing about it. Who, and who's that? 
and Professor, <laughs> Professor Bode, who I think invented the term, um, who you were debating yesterday, and I understand you did very well in your debate with a good professor. Isn't it good that professors get out and share their expertise? It was there? snowing and, this morning in Chicago. And Josh is really good about that. He gets out and he shares, and he cares about y'all. He lobbies to, for people to hire y'all all the time, so he's a oh, great professor, both stop. in the classroom and caring about the students. But what I was going to say is the shadow docket is the is I and I tell Professor Vladek this it, that I call it that you know it's the emergency motions docket. Uh, it's not as that's not as an exciting way to talk about it, but it's certainly a legitimate thing to study uh, and talk about how do you handle your emergency motions. But we have an emergency motions docket, and in fact, you know, our court has had to do administration, and I, that I've given input to on how do we handle our emergencies. And you want to handle emergencies in a way that's readily accessible, but that you have the information you need before you make the decision. And you want to give reasons, um, but th sometimes there's a there's that's a competing value with I want to get the answer to the people as quick as possible. So how do you do that best? We could. You know, probably a lot of different ideas on that. Anything else? Come what on. other questions do you have? Oh, we got lots of questions. Oh, no, we're good. So I'm, I'm still kind of working through this in my head. I'm not sure that I paid attention well enough, okay. just because the complexity. Kind no, of it's, it's, it's okay. You, you described Jennifer's problem as the legislature outsourcing the potential legislation type activities to agencies who then create rules and who are not really beholden to anybody doing their own regulation? I think there's there's a lot to that. Now, I don't want to be uber critical of Congress. Congress needs, in the idea of agencies, you would want to, to Congress, they can have hearings and things and have scientists come and testify and submit briefs, but there is a benefit to having people study things that are very complex uh, so I'm not so I'm not dissing that no, in sure, any way. You, you but it. yeah, I was, I was, yeah. My question was going to be was I was I was just sitting here I was kind of thinking about well what else would you do if you have this tremendous workload of like that, that Congress can't necessarily handle efficiently? You would almost have to outsource it. So I was going to ask you. Do well, they? Now, how many that, how many laws are they passing? Do, is this the have least? you seen the the pictures? And I'm sure Professor Blackman could send you of the laws that are passed yeah. versus the regulations that are passed? Have mm -hmm. you seen the, um, the comparisons? The, the, well, your premise assumes that they're so busy making so many laws that they can't get around to these other laws. I don't know that, even if that were true, I don't think that the fact that you're busy means you, I, I, can't, give, I can't give Professor Blackman half my docket because I'm, the Fifth Circuit is the most overworked <laughs> court. A um, law professor said, know, I write the first draft of Fifth Circuit's opinions. Well, I think the answer to my question was going to be, what would you do instead of the current setup? It sounds like chunking back some of the Congress. Well, I mean, I I, it would be great if Congress could embrace its power and really roll up its sleeves and work through hard issues yeah. and on which they may have to compromise between right. different viewpoints to pass laws. All right, may, may, another question. Mm -hmm. Yes, go ahead. So this is for the both of you all. If you could, regardless of what anyone else wants to tell me, if you could ask the founding fathers what their solution would be, what would they say? And also, we could be, who could say the founding fathers? Mm. <laughs> That's a hard question. That's hard. How do you pick a favorite child? Um, yeah. Uh, you know, I, it's, it's sort of a, I'm gonna dodge your question, I'll explain why, right? People say, oh, the framers lived 200 years ago, right? They couldn't have imagined society today. I agree with that. And there's a mechanism to deal with it, which is Article 5, right? You can amend the Constitution. We've had many amendments, but not nearly enough, I don't think. We had amendments to the Bill of Rights a couple years after the founding. We had amendments after the Civil War. We had amendments during the Progressive Era. We've had amendments in the 20th century, but we don't really amend our Constitution anymore. And the reason why is the courts started making stuff up so they didn't have to amend it. You know, maybe it would be a good idea to give agencies broad power to make rules. And if two-thirds of both houses and three-quarters of the states agree with that, then hell, it's part of the Constitution and we will faithfully execute that. 
What I don't like is, well, judges and agents saying, well, you know, we don't really need to go to the people, we'll just sort of do this because it's easy, it saves time, whatever else. Um, in terms of uh, founding fathers, probably, probably an underrated one is James Wilson. Doesn't get nearly enough credit from Pennsylvania, served in the Supreme Court. That's Look him up. That's a good one. He does not get enough credit, and he was a very influential, he was a professor, he taught at what's now UPenn, he gave lots of lectures in the Constitution. I'm partial to James Wilson. Yeah, yeah? that's a good answer. Yeah. You're welcome. That's a really good answer. Y'all know who was on the cover of this thing? Who is this guy? Madison. Yeah. By the way, if you flip this upside down, it's Ralph Cramden. <laughs> you ever notice that? Look, yep. is it the no, hat, the hat? I never thought it was Ralph It's Ralph Cramden. Cramden. That's you funny. flip, That's funny. someone told me that yesterday, yeah. I couldn't believe it. Um, you know, I don't think it's that they're too busy or don't care. I think the worst thing that judges or agencies can do is that they want to help. <laughs> they want to solve the problem and they think they know better than everybody else. Not because of some technical thing, I'm just saying my, the world has a problem and I am the one, you know, people are said, help me, Obi-Wan, you're the only, my only hope. If a judge or an agency thinks that they are the only hope, I think that causes a hubris. Yeah. Uh, and even in the most benevolent, because they, they're trying to be good, that's when it's really dangerous. So um, it's too hard to well, is that, uh, The that scariest that. thing you ever hear is, I'm from the government, I'm here to help. Uh, so that, I think yeah. that our uh, time is probably up. Is our time up or not yet? Uh, we have to go 1.45. Oh, okay. Y'all can go. If, if you need yeah. to go, but we My can stick around. My law clerks need to go, but. Uh, Bye, law clerks. Good seeing Bye. you. Bye. Uh, yeah, right there. Yeah, Congress can write legislation at any time. Even when there is a regulation, Congress could come in and put write legislation and override it. They, Congress controls what's gonna happen. They, they have the ultimate power at any stage in this. I mean, it could be vetoed, that's a possibility. But um, Congress has the power even after the agency has done its work. Even before it's overruled. It, or not that it would be, but you know, either way, it, while we're merrily going along, Congress always has that power. Did you have some comment on that? Um, you know, it's sort of a, of a weird thing with, with Chevron because once an agency, once a court decides that a statute's ambiguous, every administration can then take advantage of that ambiguity, and unless Congress takes the act of repealing the statute, they can't get over that. And that requires, as you noted, both houses of Congress and probably overruling a presidential veto, which requires a significant number of votes. So, in other words, you know, it's like once you make that ambiguous statute, you're sort of stuck with it for life. There is a law, or a, law a bill called the RAINS Act. That's R E I N S, RAINS. It's is never that been passed. Still being proposed? It's still a thing. It's never been passed. But this would give basically a fast track to Congress to repeal a statute. I'm sorry, to repeal a regulation and basically says, no, no, no the, the, the RAINS Act is not in effect, but um, the Congressional Review Act is, not the RAINS Act. But anyway, these are laws that sort of allow regulations to sort of be scaled back, but they're, they're very hard to do. Yeah, it is true that once something's ambiguous, then if the Supreme Court tells us it's ambiguous, Good enough for me. That, you know how we, we said, oh, well, if two or three judges disagree, it doesn't make it ambiguous. If the Supreme Court tells me it's ambiguous, it's ambiguous. I'm an inferior judge. And I'm gonna, I have to rule this way the Supreme Court says, I don't get to go rogue. So that has a tremendous power if the Supreme Court actually hears and says in an act is ambiguous. Yes, do you have another question? Yeah. Well, it's sort of a hard question because before Chevron, you didn't really think about ambiguity. What I would say is that, um, I mean, one of the ironies of this is that who was president in 1984? Reagan, right? It was Republican administrations who wanted Chevron. Why? Because they were sick and tired of these liberal courts in the District of Columbia making stuff up. I'm slightly exaggerating, but not much. And even Justice Alito mentioned yesterday, like, wait a minute, weren't we, weren't conservatives saying that, you know, agencies are 
that, that the agencies need this power, that you shouldn't have courts second-guessing agencies. So there's been something of reversal. And even Justice Scalia, who, you know, bless his soul, changed his mind on Chevron over the last 30 years of his life. Initially, he said Chevron's good, then later he started thinking again, saying, well, maybe we've given courts too much power. I think the period of 2008 through 2016 may have done that to him, but you know, that, that, that's, that's where he wound up at the end. Other questions? Yes. I'm sure that will be an argument that people make. That, that I think you'll be a very good lawyer. Um, that, that good. Okay. We, we need more transactional right. lawyers. No, but that would be, yeah, you would argue that percolation causes confusion. And, and agencies argue that from time to time in lots of circumstances, mm -hmm. that percolation itself is bad. Other people say percolation is good because it gets all the points out on the table. Percolation means that it's working its way through in various circuits around the country, various district courts, various circuit courts, and it's getting getting resolved. Uh, there are certain things that cannot have different rules, though, in different states, and that's where it causes. We have issues um, with nationwide injunctions, um, other types of things that that further complicate this issue, and. Uh, because of the percolation effect. So percolation is good, thing, good, good things because it's allowing different people to think really hard and, and get all the people's views on the table, but also it does sometimes make it to where, what are we supposed to do? And we do business in multiple places or we travel, and so what is the rule? You know, or something that, that is dissipates throughout the country. You know, some kind of pollution that's over many states and they're different in different circuits. Okay, what other questions do we have? Yes, sir. Uh, I think a lot of times we look at the courts as kind of the sole or the state, the Supreme Court, the final arbiter of the Constitution. Uh, Some of us do. <laughs> <laughs> and for uh, me in middle management, they are my, you know, they, you have, you, you want me in middle management to say I am fiercely going to follow because you don't want rogue middle management. That's, that's, a, that's chaos. Mm -hmm. But peep scholars would say, <laughs> you know, everybody has to interpret the Constitution for themselves, every branch. And so a president shouldn't sign a law saying, oh, the courts will take care of that. Everybody has taken the oath to follow the Constitution, and so if something's unconstitutional, that branch has to, that, that, that person should not Fault defer to the Supreme Court. There's an issue on that. But in me, middle management, I should defer to the Supreme Court. Did you have something on that? Uh, you know, um, the Constitution says nothing about the Supreme Court having the final say. There's a supremacy clause. The Constitution is supreme. The judges take an oath to the Constitution. They don't take an oath to the Supreme Court. Uh, so I think it's an accident of history that the Supreme Court has a final say. But that's sort of where we are now. Yeah, that is not. That's in, not the conventional. And view. that's not in Marbury. Either. No, it, no, it is not. Marbury does not say that. Marbury My doesn't will learn say that. that. You may class. have heard that it's somewhere. A myth. The, myth. That Marbury doesn't say that. That was later. That came in the fifties at most. But that's that's an interesting topic for another speaker another day. Thank you so much for having me. I'm crazy about y'all. Do you know that? She loves it here. I love it here. You know. I have a lot of things to do, and um, so I'm a little bit sometimes scattered. But I I come here because I love to come here, uh, and I believe in this enterprise that you're in together. It, it means I think they're doing school really well here. I, I think it's great y'all come together. You're not a divisive. No student. one's protesting it's, you. You well, I mean, I've had protesters. It's so you can protest me if you want, but um, I hope you're polite about it. But um, but but you can protest me. But it's it's really important that you're in this enterprise together. That you uh, it's both practical and cerebral, and that you have these professors that you know really care about you being successful. 
So this is a unique place to go to school, and I want you to all be wildly successful, uh, and I want to know you as you, when you graduate. Thank you so much for having me today. Thank you, ma'am. Did I say anything?